Hello, Auto50, and welcome to steering and wheel alignment. Hopefully, you watched the previous suspension video. Um, some of that background knowledge will be helpful to today's lecture uh, or this video's lecture. So let's go ahead and screen share. We can hop right in it. So steering systems and wheel alignment. I believe wheel alignment was chapter 42 and steering system was chapter 38. Um, so moving along, I won't go through all the objectives. Um, hopefully you're following along on uh, with your PowerPoint. If not, make sure you're taking notes. Um, some of the things you're going to really want to take notes in because I don't have it in the PowerPoint, but I will talk about it. I will try to remind you. Um, obviously, this is something that's pretty basic right here, though. So let's just get started in its basic layer. What does steering systems do? It's exactly like it sounds. It helps you steer the vehicle or to help turn the wheels for directional control. If I want to go left because the road tends to turn left, then I want to be able to have that control. Um, and that is what steering does, keeps us from uh, going in directions we don't want to go. So I'm going to get started with the manual steering system. We won't even talk about power steering yet. Uh, let's get an understanding of how our manual steering system works. And then we can go ahead and uh, get into our um, power steering. So at its base level, steering systems have a uh, subsystem set up. So there's about three subsystems. Um, and some of these are actually just components. But there's going to be a steering column of some sort. For right now, um, we are going to get to a stage, I think, um, sooner rather than later where your steering system or, or I'm sorry your steering wheel pretty much turns into a game control input um, but it's not a game it's real life and it will tell a computer what to do and then there will be a motor that controls things but we're not quite we're on we're on the the brink of that we're not quite there yet obviously because there's some things that uh, you would be afraid of but for right now let's talk about how steering has been for a very very long time even still uh, we have a steering column and that steering column if you're following my mouse here is going to connect uh, and i actually have a slice so i don't want to get ahead of itself um, but this is sort of a subsystem here there's going to be other components potentially involved in the steering column but our steering column is going to connect our steering wheel to our steering gearbox or i'm sorry our steering gear when i say the term steering gear that's our next subsystem a steering gear is simply going to change the movement from my steering wheel to a sweeping movement to my wheels, right? Um, I believe your book talks about it as a reciprocating motion, um, or I'm sorry, a uh, rotary motion to an angular motion. Um, the two types of steering gears you're gonna come across is going to be a rack and pinion design, which is pretty much what everybody uses now, most everybody anyways, um, because it is less moving components. We'll talk about that, uh, it's a bit cheaper in the long run and then a gear box so down here is a picture of our, our uh, rack and pinion design up here is a picture of a parallelogram design that utilizes a steering gear box so when you hear this term steering gear it doesn't necessarily mean it's the gear box unless you hear that term a steering gear could be a rack and pinion it's just simply a set of gears that are going to change the motion then we have whatever our steering linkage is so on a rack and pinion design, it's a very basic linkage design because it's pretty much our tie rods, which we'll get into that because I know I haven't mentioned that. If it is a parallelogram with a steering gear box or something that is similar to, because there are a couple different designs, um, we've got a lot of components involved in our steering linkage. So those are our three sub systems as it applies to our steering. Let's start, I did mention, I, I kind of got ahead of myself here. Uh, steering column itself, seems like it would be just a basic shaft, right? But it's not always uh, that simple. And in fact, the newer cars get, the more complicated our steering columns can start to get. Um, but our steering columns are, it, its basic job is to transfer the driver input in the steering wheel to the actual steering gear down here, which would be either, again, our rack and pinion or a steering gear box. Um, now, old, old designs. Uh, was pretty much almost a solid shaft with some joints. And um, if you crashed, 
you could potentially be impaled by your steering column. There's lots of people that died in, in related accidents way back in the day. Um, if I'm not mistaken, James Dean may have been uh, killed in a similar fashion having to do with the steering column. The problem is, is uh, that's not stationary or that is stationary and will not move and it's bolted pretty sturdy and if you move into it you're a lot softer than the steering column is so what we did was is we made uh right here it says collapsible shaft there is a purposely built weak link inside our steering column any modern steering column um to purposely collapse into itself or break uh to keep it from hurting you um or killing you. So the steering column in an event of a major accident is actually meant to break on itself. When that happens, you need to buy or replace the steering column, but it is a safety feature that's meant to help protect you. Um, snaz your steering columns, get uh, some options like tilt shift, which uh, tilt steering columns, they're really common nowadays. I, I actually don't know of any that don't have them. Um, but even in the early 2000s and stuff, there were base base models that didn't come with tilt wheel is what they call it. So tilt wheel is a lever that you pull down right here. It says tilt adjust lever in the picture. You would pull down or pull to the side, uh, depending on manufacturer. And when you'd release the lever, it would allow you to tilt the steering wheel upward or downward, whether you're taller or shorter, which is really nice, especially because I am vertically challenged. So if I hop in a car that doesn't have tilt wheel, I feel like a bus driver. Um, I need a foam <laughs> or a booster's beat. So uh, tilt, tilt wheel uh, is helpful. And the snazzy ones have telescoping features so when you pull the lever, not only will it tilt up or down, but it will also tilt in and out. Again, if you're vertically challenged like myself, you can pull it inward, or if you're taller, then you can push it outward or larger. Um, always keep in mind, you don't want to be hugging that steering wheel. You don't want to be super duper close, because if you do get into an accident, guess what comes out of that steering wheel? An airbag. So you want to make sure that you do keep a, a safe distance from your steering wheel. Obviously, you want to be able to reach it, but uh, you, you don't want to be super close to it. Um, steering gear boxes. So now that we know from the steering wheel, uh, there's a couple of things I'm not talking about purposely because this is simply a principal lecture. Um, when you get into a suspension class, we are actually going to get a lot more in depth on um, steering columns and we'll get into clock springs and certain types of sensors and lockouts and things like that because there there's some uh, intricacies in steering columns. But for this class, we're just going to go ahead and breeze through it so you have a basic understanding as to what's going on. So we've got our steering wheel connects to our steering column, uh, usually through a nut, sometimes it's a press fit. Um, and then at the bottom, down here, you can see we've got a, or up here, you can see we've got a spline shaft. This is a steering gear box. Uh, design. We'll talk about rack and pinion in the slide or two here. It is going to be some sort of spline shaft and my steering column through some sort of universal joint will usually connect to my steering gearbox here and it is going to transmit that sort of rotary motion, um, that round motion that I'm doing with my steering wheel and down here it's going to spin a shaft. Uh, the, there are two different designs. We've got what we call a recirculating ball, which is uh, kind of what we're looking at here with the ball bearings. And then we have a worm and roller. Um, this is sort of a basic design here, but I don't want to get too into these steering gearbox designs. I will in a suspension and steering class. We'll talk about how these gearboxes work, measurements, and, and how to take them apart and, and things like that. But for now, this is its basic design. So as this shaft moves, I wanna explain this shaft as uh, almost like a drill bit. So it has that like swirl look, kind of like this worm does here. So when you hear the term worm gear, that's sort of what it's referring to. And it's got, it's showing an x-ray version right here, like a cutaway, but this is actually uh, right here, they're calling it a ball nut rack. And it's got these recirculating ball bearings inside. And as this shaft, Spins, this P 
piece is actually going to be able to move up and down on it, right? Kind of, um, kind of like a swirly slide, right? So instead of swirling now, um, as the shaft moves out, it's almost like a bolt, sorry, that would be the best analogy. So if I turn a bolt to loosen it, it's going to pull this piece down. If I turn it to tighten, it's gonna pull it up. And that's exactly how this uh, ball nut rack is, is showing. And as this moves up and down, if you're following with my mouse here, we've got this ball nut rack that is moving up and down, uh, connecting with a sector gear. Now this sector gear is going to move along with the teeth. So if this moves up, this sector gear is going to turn upward like that. And if it moves down, it's gonna turn downward. Well, this sector gear is going, and I know there's a lot of terms here. Again, we'll revisit this when we get into suspension. But as the sector gear is sort of spinning down here, this is what we have, uh, something called a Pittman shaft, which will connect to a Pittman arm. I'll explain that in a few. Um, but this shaft is sort of gonna start to spin like this now. And we're gonna put an arm down here on this spline that is gonna take that spinning motion and is going to sweep it. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I don't want to get too into these designs uh, because, like I said, it can get very confusing very quickly. These designs, a steering gear box, whether it be worm and roller or recirculating ball, can be manual or power steering, um, either design. They work the same. Uh, they just have little add-ons in there for power steering to help out. So that, remember that Pittman shaft I was just talking about here? Um, so if we look at this down here, the sector gear connecting to the Pittman shaft is gonna connect down to this Pittman arm. So now that this shaft is spinning like this, this Pittman arm is gonna be sliding in here, is going to sweep as that spins. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And as this Pittman arm sweeps, it's going to move this uh, piece in the center, it's called the center link, back and forth also known as a track rod. And to keep everything from flopping around, I've got a second arm, very similar to my Pittman arm, um, but just to keep my track rod or center link center when it's moving back and forth, we're gonna connect another arm called an idler arm. But instead of connected to another steering gear, it's actually gonna be connected to the frame. And we're gonna have a pivot here and a pivot here. So our center link moves nice and even back and forth. Well, how do we get that movement out to the wheels? Uh, through these tie rods here. So I've got a sort of what would be an inner tie rod. This design is a little bit different because it's a parallelogram and an outer tie rod. And then we're gonna have an adjustment sleeve. I believe there's a homework question about that one. Um, these tie rods are gonna be connected from our center link over to, remember that steering knuckle we talked about? Hopefully you watched that video. Um, that steering knuckle, and if you watch that video, I also talked briefly about tie rods connecting to that steering knuckle so we can turn our wheels. Well, these are the tie rods I was talking about. So as my center link moves this way, my tie rod is also going to move that way, which is going to push my steering knuckle to pivot, right? Because it's fixed on our suspension. So only one side is going to pivot, allowing the front of our wheels or the rear of our wheels, depending on the design, to pivot back and forth, whether I want to turn right or left. Now, this is where, when we get into a wheel alignment, I'm gonna talk about something called toe. And that is if we're looking at, I'm gonna stop share here for a moment so we can all look at something. If I'm looking at my uh, tires from the top, right? So this is the top view. We want, our tires to be pretty parallel with each other, right? What we don't necessarily want is a situation where I've got one tire that's tilting out that way. And this is with my steering wheel facing forward, right? So this is our steering wheel facing forward. Um, if our steering wheel is facing forward and I've got my wheels looking like this, that's a problem, right? I've got one tire that wants to go that way, one tire that wants to go that way, so we're not really gonna turn in either of those directions, and it's gonna end up causing issues. We'll talk about that when we get into tow, what kind of issues it's gonna cause as far as tire wear and handling goes. But 
those tie rod lengths, whether they're shorter or longer on one side, that is going to control what we call toe. And it's exactly like you might spell it, toe. So I will come back to that later. I just wanted to, while we're sort of looking at everything, um, take a look at all that so you guys can see how that relates when we get more in depth on that. So we're going to make that adjustment by turning this adjusted sleeve, and it's not labeled here, so you may want to make a note, but this is going to be an adjustment sleeve that's going to have some sort of lock nut on it to tighten it or keep it in place when you're driving. But when you want to change that toe I was talking about, this is where you would turn the adjustment sleeve and you would either lengthen or shorten the tie rod to get your tire straight with the steering wheel straight when you're making an alignment. So that's your quick toe adjustment um, and hopefully that helps out with that homework question. So moving along here, here's another example of a parallelogram design. Um, this is a, so the picture we just looked at would be say like a front view. Um, this picture here would be more of a top view from the driver's side um, or, or from like, say if we're looking at it from the driver. So my steering gear box, if it is a vehicle anyways, that is uh, left-hand drive is going to be on the driver's side and we are going to have our steering gear. So here's our worm and roller that I talked about here. Um, we've got a, a hidden pitman arm. So our notice here's our sector that would go straight down to our pitman arm and our pitman arm is going to sweep back and forth. Remember I talked about the center link. Here's uh, that same, I told you it's also called a track rod. So this is that same piece and here are our tie rod ends. Uh, we've got an inner, here's our outer, it's showing just tie rod, but that's our adjustment sleeve here. Here's our steering knuckle, um, and, and again, it's the same thing that we just looked at, same operation, um, it's just showing it from a different view, so hopefully that helps. Um, now let's get into what we use now. Let's talk about that. Look at this. If I look, oh, what's going on here? Um, I may have lost my microphone where's my audio hold on one second guys ah i don't know why it disconnected back yes okay i don't know why i'm having weird messages okay let's look at this right here one of these days i'm gonna figure out how to write on here as i'm talking about it oh maybe i can yeah, okay, I've got a pen. So let's look at all the wear points here on our system. So this right here is gonna be a spline for crying out loud. Okay, I don't know why it's being weird. Um, let's look at the wear points. This right here is gonna be splined to our Pittman shaft or sector shaft, so it, can be considered it's not really a wear point like a ball joint like a like any of the joints are this right here that's not very thick here um this right here is a ball and socket joint this right here is a ball and socket joint this right here is a ball and socket joint this right here is a ball and socket joint that's another uh piece that um isn't it's like the, the pitman arm over here we've got a ball and socket oops a ball and socket joint from our, so we've got an inner and an outer ball and socket joint on our tie rods. So we're looking at a total of six wear points here that are gonna need to be maintenance and greased every so often. Uh, also service, they have a service life because uh, play, we start to get extra clearance inside. And so you're gonna start to get to a point where you can move your steering wheel, but my wheels don't really move too much. And there's something called a dry park test you can look at and, and do. Um, so if you're sitting, the, the vehicle needs to be sitting on a level, well, not necessarily level, but it needs to be sitting on ground where the tires are, are touching the ground and there's weight on them. You're going to have somebody sort of rock the steering wheel back and forth. Um, we don't necessarily want to see the wheels move back and forth. So I'm going to turn to one side to where I can start to see movement and turn to the next side to where I start to see movement and just go back and forth like that. And you're going to want to look, it's a two person job. You're going to want to either have somebody or you look underneath the vehicle at all your wear points and see if you see lots of extra movement there. 
Um, so if I see movement in my pitman arm, but I don't see movement in my center link, I know that this wear point right here is a problem. And so there's ways for you to be able to sort of look at some of this stuff and determine if uh, one of these or all of them need to be serviced, so on and so forth. So that's kind of how that one goes. Let's see if I can go to the next one here. Okay, back to, uh, so, so that's a downfall of our parallelogram system. There's lots of extra components. Um, there's lots of moving stuff and wear points. Rack and pinion designs are a lot cheaper to maintain. There is very little maintenance. Um, so that's really nice. Let me see here. Okay, sorry, and more technical difficulties. So the primary components of a rack and pinion, the rack and pinion itself. So remember, we have to have input from our steering column. In this case, that is going to be our pinion gear. So right here it shows pinion. This is gonna be, if you're following my mouse here, hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I had somebody knocking at my door trying to buy my Porsche. Um, that's a big no. So anyways, back to where we uh, were before we were rudely interrupted. Um, rack and peering, rack and peering, rack and pinion. Um, so, okay, straight coming from our steering column, remember rotary motion, we are going to spin this shaft which is going to spin a, what we call a pinion gear. Uh, and if you're thinking, I've heard a pinion before. Oh yeah, remember differentials? Yeah, so remember that small gear that would spin the ring gear, that was our pinion gear. This is the small gear um, that is our pinion gear, but instead of spinning a ring gear, it's gonna spin a rack gear. So the difference between a rack gear and any other gear is that the rack gear is actually flat with a bunch of teeth on it. And you can see that right here. So it's almost like if I took an internal gear and I like split it open and put it uh, flat. So as my pinion gear, ah, as my pinion gear is uh, spinning, it is going to move my rack back and forth. So kind of like instead of having to have a steering gear to turn a pitman arm to move my center link back and forth, it is straight. There's no middle man straight from the pinion gear from our steering column that moves our rack back and forth, which is kind of nice. Um, like I said, less moving component. So we've got our pinion, we've got our rack, and then straight from our rack here, I've got my inner tie rods here, and I've got my outer tie rods here. And they are usually threaded together in this type of design. Sometimes you come across a, an adjustment sleeve, but most of the time on this design, um, this is very tiny here, but you're gonna have a lock nut, and our inner tie rod end is going to thread into our outer tie rod end. And again, changing the length of those tie rods is going to change the angle of uh, the front of our wheels. Um, and then to protect these inner tie rod ends, because this is important, um, we don't want these joints to get damaged because of debris. So we put these rubber boots on them. So when you see a rack and pin, you've got those like accordion looking rubber boots. Those are called bellows boots. And if you ever see fluid leaking from those bellows boots, it's not the boots that are bad. There shouldn't be fluid in there at all to begin with. Um, if you see fluid leaking from a rack and pinion, there is something called a rack seal on the ends of the rack. And if uh, there is a design with fluid in it and those, fluid, uh, those, those fluids leak, then those rack seals are bad, not the bellows boots and you can't really replace the rack seal, um, you pretty much have to buy a new rack and pinion. So just an FYI. Um, moving along, should be, there we go. Okay, here is a better picture of a rack and pinion design. Here's our control arms we talked about, the steering knuckles we talked about. Here's our axles. Um, here's our big sway bar that we're talking about. Here's our coil design or our coil over design. Um, you can see uh, if we were in class, I would, I would quiz you guys, but we have no upper control arm. So this is a McPherson strut design, right? So hopefully you already, again, watched that video. Here's what we're concerned with. Here's our rack and pinion. It's not an x-ray view. So we can see this is where um, underneath here, this is where our pinion gear is gonna come in and our rack gear is gonna be inside here. 
and you can see some lines. These lines may or may not be for fluid. Uh, if it's a non-power steering design, it may just be for air to transfer air from one side to the other so we don't get uh, these bellows boot vacuum closed and, and one side all blown up. So it's just simply to distribute air sometimes. Sometimes it's for fluid if I've got more than two lines. So just keep that in mind. But here's our outer tie rod ends connecting to our steering column. Our inner tie rod ends being protected by the bellows boots connecting to our rack gear. Uh, so that's how rack and pinion design works without power steering. Oh, and here's some more internal pieces. Uh, so here's our pinion gear, again, coming from our steering column, moving in a rotary motion. And as that moves, it's going to move my rack back and forth. Look at this bottom picture here. So this is a power steering design. I've got fluid lines that come up through here for our power steering, but this is still our pinion gear. And down here is our rack gear. You notice how the teeth angle changes depending on how far it moves on each side. That is a variable type of rack and pinion design. So maybe the tighter the turn I uh, am trying to make, it will change the ratio of how fast that pinion is able to move the rack. And that's really helpful because you you want a different amount of turning sometimes. If I'm trying to turn my steering wheel all the way in one direction, we want to allow for more turning. If I just want to make a lane change, I don't want to make a lane change into the next three lanes, right? So I, in the small amounts of movement, I, I only want small amounts of movement. Um, and the further I turn my steering wheel, the more it may help me turn. So this is really helpful. Uh, and again, this, like I said, this is called a, uh, it, it's a variable rate rack and pinion design. Here's a closer look at our tie rods. Here's our inner that threads into the rack. Uh, here is our inner that threads into the outer tie rod end. Here's the bellows boot that protects it. Here's what it looks like all put together. Um, and then we'll have some sort of either a lock nut or a castle nut with a cotter pin holding all this together. When this boot starts to rip or even any of your ball joint boot starts to rip and you can see the inside of that joint, more than likely um, there, there are pieces where sometimes they'll allow you just replace the boot. Uh, but if it's been that way for a while, you're probably just going to need to replace the joint. So keep that in mind. Now, when we're talking about power steering, right here it says may use hydraulic pressure to assist driver. This is changing so much to where less and less vehicles are using hydraulic pressure. Hydraulic meaning we're using fluid to assist the, the steering. We are getting a lot more into electric power steering, which I've got another slide. Let's talk about this as it applies to like your conventional power steering design that we've been using for many, many years now before we get into the new stuff. So a hydraulic power steering design is usually gonna have some sort of belt driven pump. So right here, you've got a pump. I think I've got better pictures here uh, in the next slide but there's gonna be some sort of pulley on the front that's gonna be engine driven off of an accessory or serpentine belt. And that pump is going, or, or in that uh, pulley is going to spin a pump. That pump is going to pump pressure into our steering system. I want to make this abundantly clear. Um, our power steering usually doesn't come in contact to our steering gears directly. So it's not really meant to lubricate steering gears it's meant to help push the steering in one direction or the other. So the fluid is actually usually separate. Now in this picture here, we're gonna have some sort of fluid reservoir. So after it's done using the fluid, it cycles back through. Um, it may go through a cooler of some sort. So it looks like a little radiator or it may go through the radiator in its own chamber itself to get cooled down. And then it's gonna come back to the reservoir and keep continuing through. Um, if you are just going straight, your power steering may not need a whole lot of pressure or any at all because you're not really doing anything with the steering. But when you're cranked all the way to one side or the other, make, maybe you're making a really tight U-turn, we can get this pump to pump really high pressures, uh, sometimes in case of over a thousand PSI. 
So sometimes when you turn the steering wheel all the way in one direction, you sort of get this sound, you get like a funky sound. Um, there's nothing wrong with your power steering pump. It's usually pretty normal. You don't want to have the steering wheel cranked in one direction for a long period of time because again, we are pumping very high amounts of pressure and therefore you're going to get more susceptible to creating leaks and things like that and putting a load on the system. So don't just sort of leave it there while you're having a conversation um, with somebody. Make your turn and, and be done with it. Um, but that is why they sort of get noisy. Um, also power steering pumps after they've been ran really low on fluid, especially Ford power steering pumps, they have a tendency to sort of get uh, real noisy and they don't ever quit. Some are more forgiving than others, um, but that's just something to keep in mind. That's sort of the gist of how our power steering systems work. Power, system, power steering systems generally will use some sort of automatic transmission fluid very commonly just uh, general ATS red fluid. Lots of other companies may use their own power steering fluid. A Honda is one of those companies is actually a clear, uh, almost looks like brake fluid, but it's not brake fluid type of fluid. Uh, so just keep that in mind when you're servicing your power, when you're servicing any fluid uh, system or any hydraulic system, you need to go and look at the specific type of fluid that that system takes so you don't damage anything. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, the power steering pressure is going to be dependent on how much input you're asking of it. If you're trying to turn a lot, it's gonna to try to help you a lot. If you're not turning at all, it's not really gonna to try to help at all. Um, so if we're looking at this here, here's a much closer pick here. So coming from our steering column, we've got actually two U-joints here. This is not really ideal to be honest, but neither here nor there. Um, here is our pinion gear. Here's our rat gear. Notice there's no fluid over here at all. We've got fluid, uh, a seal and fluid on this side with a piston. So notice from my power steering pump, the reservoir is right on top of the pump here. Here's our pulley coming off the engine. We've got a pressure line and we've got a return line. The pressure lines have a tendency to leak a lot more common than the return line because of pressure. So when the pressure is coming from the pump, fluid is pumped through down through this line here and is going to shove uh, fluid on one side. Actually, this is a different design than I thought. So we've got a uh, fluid that can be pumped on this side. If it pushes our piston, if I've got a lot of pressure over here and no pressure over here, it's gonna push the piston this way, which is going to move my rack in this direction. So this looks like the car's facing this way it is going to push my, my wheels to the left. If I put fluid instead coming from this way, it is going to push this piston in this direction, turning my wheels to the right. So that's how a rack and pinion power steering generally works. Now I wanna make a quick announcement. I know I'm shoving in a ton of like little tiny bits of information that might be too much for this class, but uh, if you are one of those people who, um, you're trying to squeeze every little horsepower out of your Camry that you can. And you are like, I'm going to eliminate power steering. I'm going to take that pump out because this power steering pump is being driven off of the engine. So it does turn into what you might call a parasitic load on the engine, meaning it's sort of stealing little bits of horsepower. Um, not much, usually just a couple horsepower, but if we're talking a lightweight vehicle and, and it could be in the difference between winning a race or losing a race. So um, some people will do a power steering delete. They'll just disconnect uh, the pump or just take off the, the belt all to, together and just leave it. Here's the problem with that. Um, power steering rack and pinions don't like not having fluid in here. And so a power steering rack won't last very long without the power steering. If you want to eliminate power steering and you want to do it correctly, you should get a rack and pinion that is a manual rack and pinion, not a power steering rack and pinion. Um, or you can just wait until this one goes out, but uh, that's just something to think about. Uh, power steering systems on a gearbox is sort of similar uh, in the sense that we've got, uh, here, here's our reservoir returning fluid. Here is our pump, pumping pressure. 
into our steering gear box here and it will put pressure in one direction or another and this is not a really great picture but these lines are to help assist turn that shaft in one direction or the other um let's see i might have a better picture here if not we might be stuck but uh, that's sort of what this is showing here on a steering gear box we usually have some sort of pinning and rotary control valve where we just call it a control valve in here which is going to determine which direction it's going to help it go in but notice fluid is over here the fluid is not necessarily where our uh, steering gear is located Let's see if this will actually seem to be sort of laggy here okay so here's a better picture of our power steering pump itself this is a vein design so you've got little veins that sort of come out rather than a gear but it doesn't have to be a vein design it usually is um, we're going to have to have some sort of pressure relief valve especially when we've got uh, high pressure design so or, or a high pressure situation where I'm maybe cranking the steering wheel all the way in one direction or the other uh, we might be pumping way more psi than we actually need so we're going to have to have some sort of pressure relief valve um, and as I already mentioned, it may use its own fluid or it may use steering, or I'm sorry, uh, ATF. Here is what a power steering pump and reservoir might look like. It's very common on these designs for the dipstick to be located. Here's the side picture. Here's our cap, our fill cap. The dipstick is generally located on that fill cap. If it's not, then it's a reservoir that's going to be marked kind of like a brake fluid reservoir, uh, full or low. And you'll just have to look at the clear reservoir to see what level the fluid is in. Um, but the fluid should be clean. So if it's supposed to be a yellow amber color like a Honda fluid, then it should be clean, yellow or amber. If it's supposed to be red, then it should be red, not brown. Um, your power steering fluid should never look like black coffee. So if it looks like that, you need a flush. <laughs> um, okay, so. Let's get into the new stuff, electronic rack and pinion designs. We don't really do the steering gear anymore. Um, so I'm not saying they don't exist, you just don't ever see them. But uh, most of the time, newer vehicles are going to electronic power steering designs. Why? We don't have any hoses, we don't have a heavy pump, uh, we don't have to worry about extra fluid. So right there, uh, it's going to be cheaper to maintain, and it's not going to have as many things to break. Instead of using fluid and a hydraulic piston moving back and forth, or a rotary control valve that's allowing fluid to move things in one direction or the other, instead we use an electric motor for power assist. There are a couple different designs here, so um, the top and bottom picture here are actually pretty similar. Sometimes I have a motor that is directly on the steering column. In these two pictures, we have an electric motor that is down on the rack itself. So it can be either or. Um, what's really nice about this design, besides all the things I had already mentioned, is that on a hydraulic power steering system, in order to get hydraulic pressure, the engine must be running. So as soon as you turn that engine off, even if it's key on, you have no power steering. If you are maybe pushing a car, maybe the engine doesn't run, this can be sort of a pain in the butt. Power steering is really needed when you're going at slow speeds, not at high speeds. So if you're trying to move a vehicle, that can be really tough, especially if the ground is super rough or the tires are low and so on and so forth. What's really nice about electronic rack and pinion design, as soon as you key on, so not even engine on, just key on, this is ready to go and you have power steering. So that's really nice. Uh, I gave you guys a video in the YouTube links about electronic uh, rack and pinion or electronic steering design on CTEC 101. It's, a, it's actually a really nice video. It shows you, um, it shows you that, that system I was kind of talking about where your steering wheel is actually just an input sensor. What's really cool about this design too is that it's not all power steering all the time. It actually has a sensor that is determining how hard you or, or the effort that you're putting in into the steering in left or right direction. And it will just simply multiply that force 
in that direction. So if I'm only giving a little input, it's only going to give me a little power steering. If I'm trying to give it a lot of input, then it's going to give me a lot back to help me out. So it's uh, it's really nice in that way. But he sort of gets into the point of uh, your steering wheel eventually is going to end up being simply an input sensor, like a gain controller. Um, and it is going to tell a computer what you want. And that computer is going to send a message to the electric motors to turn in whatever direction you want. So it's kind of a cool deal. A little scary, but we're, we're going to get to the point to where it should be safe. The next design is going to, so that is our manual and power steering, um, our steering gearbox and rack and pinion design. Let's get into a, another extra sort of piece of steering, which is four wheel steering. Not all vehicles have it. Some select vehicles have it. It sort of keeps coming in and then leaving and coming in and then leaving. And the reason for this is because most of the time, drivers, daily drivers going to point A to point B, they don't like it because sometimes it's a little bit too much. Uh, um, you can almost think of it as like an assistant, but it's too reactive for them. Um, it, it's too fast. And so they feel like they're not as in control, but if you know how to drive well, this can actually help you a lot. So we've got a couple different types of systems, but first we need to note that we have our conventional front gear, whether whatever system, uh, it's usually gonna be rack and pinion, but uh, we're gonna have some sort of front steering gear, uh, but we're also gonna need to have a rear steering gear as well. So we've got two steering gears, one for the front wheels, one for the rear wheels. This can be a mechanical design. Um, this can be a hydraulic design. And any new stuff or remotely new stuff is usually electric because running hydraulic lines from front to back is a pain in the butt. It's expensive. Mechanical designs always went out and came out of adjustment. Um, I want to say the Honda Prelude was an example of that one. And those had issues on the four wheel steering quite often. There are two two, uh, we'll say, modes to your four-wheel steering, and not all four-wheel steering vehicles utilize both modes. So we've got opposite phase mode and same phase mode, and it's exactly like what you might think. So I've got a picture here. We've got opposite phase, which is on the right here, where my front wheels are gonna turn in one direction, and my rear wheels, because it's opposite phase, are gonna turn in the opposite direction. What's really nice about this phase or this mode is uh, it's meant for low speed only, and it's meant to assist you in a sharp turn. This will help you make U-turns like you wouldn't believe. It helps you make really, really sharp turns in a small space, but it is very, uh, if, you, if you turn a little bit, it is going to really turn you a lot. So if I had opposite phase at high speed, this could be really, really bad. So opposite phase is always used in low speed. Same phase is exactly what it sounds like. So we've got our front wheels moving to the left and our rear wheels, if you pay close attention here, are moving to the left as well, but not near to the degree that our front wheels are. And that goes with opposite phase as well. Our rear wheels are never really designed to move at the degree that our front wheels do in any of the four wheel steering systems. Um, it's not necessary. A little goes a long way. This is gonna be used for lane changing um, in, in high speed style uh, uh, maneuvering. So this will be at high speed to sort of help you glide into the next lane. Opposite phase is gonna help you get into, uh, move around, maneuver around in small spaces that will make it easier. Let me see here. Um, okay, so advantages. The advantage of a four-wheel steering or, or uh, greatly helped out, it becomes a lot more stable. The response is super fast, which is why inexperienced drivers don't like it because they are too responsive and uh, it's something that will take getting used to, but it can be really helpful once you get used to it. But again, most drivers are to point A to point B type people. And so not everybody really wants this. This is why generally uh, Chevy, this is popular in uh, Chevy trucks. Um, 
especially if you're looking at something like a long bed, this could help out a ton because those the turning radius of those suck. But uh, Chevy utilizes sort of design on there. So just, I don't know why it keeps giving me messages. I, hopefully you guys aren't saying that. Um, if you are, sorry. Um, newer designs, these are coming on sportier type vehicles. Um, again, because if you're buying a sportier type vehicle, the chances of you being a super inexperienced driver, I guess, is low. I don't know what they're thinking, but that's those are the type of vehicles that you'll generally see four wheel steering on. Let's get into alignment. Alignment is fun and very important. So first things first, when do you need an alignment? People think it's a mileage thing. People think like, oh, every 5,000, every 10,000, I need to go get an alignment. No, you don't. Um, what you need to do is determine how your vehicle handles. So if I have any handling issues related to alignment angles, and, and here's some examples of that. Um, some terms that you're going to want to know is, uh, first one is pull. A pull is when I am driving straight, my steering wheel is straight, and as soon as I let go of the steering wheel, the car wants to go to the right every time. That's a pull. Um, if it is a very, very slight pull, maybe I let go of the steering wheel and eventually always tends to go to the right, that's going to be more of what we call a drift. So there is a difference between a pull and a drift, and usually that has to do with the aggressiveness of the alignment angles themselves. If you hit curbs or things like that, these can change your alignment angles, causing these types of issues. Another issue might be something called SWOC, also known as steering wheel off center. So if, um, if my steering wheel is center and I'm holding the steering wheel and the car wants to go to the left, but if I correct my steering wheel and I'm able to go straight and I let go of the steering wheel and it continues to go straight, the only problem is, is that my steering wheel is not straight, but the car keeps going straight, that's a steering wheel off center and that's going to be an alignment issue as well. So if you're running into those types of issues, maybe the car wanders back and forth all the time, maybe uh, you have a vibration at a particular speed then I would take it in to check your alignment to see if it needs to be adjusted. Also, if I'm having abnormal tire wear, I'm gonna talk about it. I've got a couple of slides here to talk about camber, caster, and toe. I'll talk about which one um, affects your tires in a particular angle, and then we'll uh, continue um, on, on this. So abnormal tire wear is uneven tire wear. And I know we talked about tires and inflation pressures causing uneven tire wear, but if I have tire wear on one side or just the other side, that's an alignment issue. Um, so when I talked about underinflation on, on both outside edges of the tire, but not the inside edge, that's not an alignment issue. So and I know that sounds a little bit complicated, but Hopefully that makes sense. So when we have abnormal tire wear, we're having handling issues or complaints, um, or if I have replaced any sort of suspension or steering component that will affect my alignment, which is most all your suspension components. Uh, if I'm if I'm replacing a control arm, if I'm replacing um, if I'm replacing struts, if I'm replacing um, ball joints, if I'm replacing tie rod ends. Anything like that, um, any, any of those types of, if I'm replacing bushings, I'm gonna want to replace, or I'm sorry, I'm gonna want to perform a wheel alignment. So it has everything to do with performance of the vehicle or replacing component, components, not with mileage. So no need to do it every oil change or every oil change or whatever it is that you're doing because it ends up waste, you're just wasting money. You're not earning anything, but you're gonna waste money. Um, when it's not necessary. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> There's also different types of wheel alignments. So if uh, a lot of times they may just do a front wheel alignment, it means they're not gonna touch the rear wheels. And we'll talk about why that's kind of important later. Um, and probably things on my last slide actually. And then um, they have something called a toe and go type of alignment where they only fix toe. It's, it's the easiest. Uh, and cheapest alignment, but it doesn't fix all your alignment issues. So we'll talk about that in a little bit here. So wheel alignment angles are going to include camber, caster, and toe. These are what we call primary alignment angles. We're not going to get into secondary alignment angles because that's going to be a suspension class. 
So um, these alignment angles are measured in usually degrees, but can also be measured in what we call minutes. Um, and then down here, toe can be degrees, inches, or millimeters. Um, so I'm gonna stop share here for a minute um, because I just wanna briefly talk about what the heck minutes are. So if you've ever heard anything being measured in minutes, we know time is measured in minutes. But um, I want you to know that one degree which one degree is not that much to you, right? I mean, we usually talk about 45 degrees, 90 degrees. We're talking very minimal amounts of, of degrees usually here. Um, when we're making adjustments, it's usually at the worst, it's a couple of degrees, you know, um, or maybe it's part, part of a degree. So uh, let's, let's sort of make conversions here because we know, most of us all know what a degree of an angle is, right? One degree is going to equal 60 minutes, like an hour. You can think about that, right? 60 minutes. Half of a degree or 0.5 degrees is going to equal 30 minutes, half an hour. That makes sense, right? And so on and so forth. So a quarter of an hour or a, a quarter of a degree, 0.25 is going to equal 15 minutes. So when you see the term minutes, that's sort of what it's referring to. If you want to make a note in that in your notes here, that would be wise. We will talk a lot more about this when we get into suspension and, um, and the wheel alignment class. So let's go back to our screen share here. All right, so that's how we measure camber and caster uh, toe, like I said can be degrees, sometimes it is in inches or millimeters. It's measured a little bit differently. I won't get too in depth in that in this lecture. Um, camber, this is the one that if I was gonna guess what most people know, it's camber. Uh, the camber, and I'll probably end up going back to my board here, so I'll erase that. Camber is simply the tilt of the wheel inward or outward from vertical. So it's really talking about sort of the tilt of the, the upper portion or the top of my tire inward or outward. Um, I am going to make a couple of points before I, I I'm gonna stop screen share here because it's easier for me to just draw. So we've got positive camber and negative camber. And if we look at my picture here, negative camber, and again, a lot of you are very familiar with this. If we're looking at the center line through the, through the tire itself, this black line here would be perfectly center, zero camber, zero degrees, right? If my tire, the top of my tire moves inward toward the vehicle and that center line goes more inward, this right here is going to be a negative number. If the center line of my tire, maybe the top of my tire moves, outward away from the vehicle, that's going to be a positive number. It's important to note too, that camber is a tire wearing angle, meaning that if it goes too uh, excessive in degrees, it will actually start to unevenly wear your tires. And I'll explain that right now. Camber also happens to pull. Um, so if I have that that complaint I was talking about where I let go of the steering wheel and the car pulls to the right every single time, that means it's either going to be a caster issue or a camber issue. Camber pulls, and if I wanna know what direction it generally pulls, it pulls to the wheel that is most positive. So I'm gonna get out of screen share here for a moment, and we are gonna talk about this. We are gonna talk about all that is camber. So, First things first, um, let's talk about camber pulling. So uh, camber pulls positive. That's what you wanna remember, camber pulls positive. And what that means is the number doesn't have to be positive. It just needs to be more positive than the other side. And by how much? It is exactly half a degree. So 30 minutes or half a degree 
of camber difference from side to side is all you need to create a pull or a slight drift. And the more of a difference we have, the worse it gets. So if we're looking at one tire, we'll say has uh, zero, we'll say zero degrees of camber, while the other tire has, uh, we'll say, that's really aggressive there. We'll calm down. <laughs> Let's say the other tire, and this is looking at, this is from the front, front view. Because I know I, I already drew a picture of toe. That was a top view, this is a front view. So if I'm looking at my tires, I've got one that's straight up and down and one that's tilted outward. Let's say we've got uh, three degrees of camber on that one, that's positive. Since this one is more positive, the vehicle is gonna wanna pull to the right. Now, with that being said, what if I had the opposite here where I've actually got a tire that is tilted inward by, we'll say exactly point, uh, sorry, negative 0.5 degrees. Well, there is a half a degree difference between the two. This number is negative. This number is just zero, but zero is more positive than negative 0.5. And so in this case, my vehicle is going to pull to the left. Hopefully that makes sense. So camber pulls. Also, in order to have tire wear, I'll do another color here. Uh, let's see. In order to have excessive tire wear, abnormal tire wear, my tire, needs to be either in excess of uh, 0.5 degrees or lower than 0.5 degrees. So, uh, I, I'm sorry, I totally screwed that up. Let's see if I can edit that out. It's actually going to be, tire wear is usually going to be past uh, one degree or under one degree. I don't know, I was thinking, I think my brain was still on uh, pulling. So if I have anything over one degree positive, meaning, um, so we'll say this way is positive and this way is negative, because this is a uh, torque vehicle. So if my tire tilts inward more negative, anywhere past a full degree, let's say two degrees, four degrees, if you start to get crazy, I am going to have inner edge tire wear, just on the inner edge. Um, and the worse, more aggressive angle it gets, the worse this gets. So I can have the outside of my tire completely brand new and the inside of my tires to the wires, right? If it is anywhere, I should have said positive, because that would have been negative, right? Oh, geez, I'm getting my color coding all screwed up. So we've got, any more than negative one, I'm gonna to start to get inner tire wear. Any more than a positive one, where my tire's gonna to start to tilt outward, I'm going to get just outer edge wear. And that is how camber wears tires. So you are gonna to wanna to think about this. The more into alignment you get, the more you start to Realize how you can manipulate alignment angles to get certain outcomes. So let's look at pros and cons. So we'll say uh, negative camber versus positive camber, right? There are benefits and cons to both of these, right? So negative camber. Besides that, it looks cool. No. Um, negative camber is actually going to be beneficial for, uh, we'll, we'll say, good handling or good cornering. Negative camber, if I've got uh, my tire, we'll say this is my tire here, right? I've been drawing triangles. So if, um, that's a really bad. So I've got two tires here. Uh, no, my phone just turned on, that won't work. I've got a tire here, right? And we'll say uh, this is toward the inside of the vehicle. 
if I have a little bit of negative camber, when I go to turn into a corner, my tire is gonna level out. So in the corner, I'm gonna have the most contact patch possible. If I have positive camber, meaning my tires are outward like that, when I go to make a turn, this tire is going to go further on its sidewall and have even less contact patch. So we get good cornering out of negative camber. The problem of negative camber is we get a harsh ride. And the reason for this, because the wheels are tilted inward, when we get any shock moving inward, we, we get that into the passenger compartment. That's the direction that uh, it tends to go. Um, and I don't, I don't want to get too deep into that. I'll sort of leave that at that. But those are pros and cons of negative camber. Now, obviously, any angles lower than negative, uh, I don't know why I keep negative. Any angles lower than negative one degree are going to equal inside tire wear. Uh, we'll say excess inside tire wear. Oh man, my writing's working. Okay, positive. It's all give and take, right? Positive camera, as I mentioned, poor cornering. And a positive on the flip side of the harsh ride, it actually, because of our tires facing in the opposite direction, is going to give a soft ride. So it's gonna be a lot more comfortable to drive in, but it's not going to handle very well in corners at all. So there are pros and cons. Obviously, anything in excess of one degree is going to equal excess uh, outside. Uh, tire wear or outside edge tire wear. So that's just something to think about when we are talking about camera alignment angles. The whole reason why the Hella Flesh scene came in, um, why we see insane aggressive camera. First things first, in Japan they were the first to do that and it sort of became a style. Where did that even come from? So there's a couple of things. First things first, in the performance scene, um, everybody wanted a little bit of camber because it helps with cornering. So that's sort of where all of this started. Then we also had a scene that wanted to be as low as possible to the ground. If it's your thing, cool. If it's not your thing, it, it's a thing that people like. So don't, don't be like, I don't get it. I didn't, it's why do people like fast cars? Why do people, people like what they like? So some people really, really like their cars to be as low to the ground as possible. Well, in order to make that happen, sometimes I need to camber my negative, uh, camber my tires and wheel assembly a lot more negative simply to change the height so I can actually sit lower. Um, or maybe I don't have enough room in my wheel well for, for that tire wheel assembly, assembly to, to be too far straight up and down. And so we need excess negative camber. Now that's where that started. Then it became a, an ex, a, a, a fashion accessory almost to where the more negative camber you had, the cooler you were. That got insane. If, if you like that, do your thing. Go on, live your best life. But uh, just to kind of explain where that crazy uh, style came from. So that is Camber. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, like I said, please message me. I will hold a live Q&A this Wednesday at six o'clock if you have any questions from lecture or from homework. So let's go back to screen share and we'll talk about um, our caster. So that is Camber. Camber pulls most positive or to the side that's most positive and it is a tire wearing angle. And computer's moving super slow here. Okay, so this is a do. This is um, a car with moderate camber, enough for handling. This is a don't. Uh, this would be 
you can see here he's even rounded out his fenders to try to make room for those tires. So again, it's about being as low as possible to the ground. Um, let's get back here. Caster is a little bit different, actually quite a bit different. So what is going to control camber? Camber is controlled by suspension. Um, it can be where your strap mounts to the steering knuckle. It can be your upper control arm length outward or inward or lower control arm length outward or inward. That's what's going to control your camber. Caster is a little bit different. So camber is in and out. Caster is the angle of the ball joints from your upper control arm and your lower ball joint. Uh, um, frontward or rearward rather than inward or outward. So caster, you actually can't tell caster angles from looking at your tire and wheel assembly because it's not the angle of your tire and wheel assembly. It's actually the angle of your suspension frontward or rearward. So right here, I've got tilt of the upper ball joint forward or backward from vertical. This also goes for coil um, or McPherson strut designs. Obviously, we don't have an upper ball joint, so it's going to be where my uh, strut is to the lower ball joint. So the best way to look at this is, is look at a bicycle. You'll notice that both, most bicycles have what we call, and on motorcycles too, we have a different name for it, but it's the same thing. We have something called rake um, on a bicycle or a motorcycle. And you'll notice that where your pivot of the steering um, on, on your, uh, I can't think <laughs> of words, um, of your bars are moving back and forth, where that point is down to where sort of your wheel hub is it's never going to be straight up and down. And if it is, that bicycle is going to be extremely hard to control. It's going to be all over the place. That's why most of your bicycles have that angle or that rake. We call that positive caster. If it's straight up and down, it's zero caster. And if it's actually the upper pivot is forward of the, uh, uh, of our, um, like where the hub is, then that or where your lower ball joint is, then that's gonna be called negative caster. You are generally never gonna see negative caster. It would lead to really, really, really bad handling. Um, most of the time it's always gonna be positive. The more positive it is, the more directionally stable it is. The less positive it is, closer to zero, the less stable it is. So if you've ever seen like the, the uh, your grocery cart in the grocery store wobbling back and forth, it's probably because the, the caster got screwed up. So a couple of things to note. I'm gonna take off a screen share here and we'll talk about caster on the whiteboard, but uh, obviously I did mention positive and negative. Caster is not a tire wearing angle, no matter how aggressive it is. It is simply the angle of your suspension. It has nothing to do with the placement of your tire and wheel assembly, which is why, um, which is why it doesn't wear out tires. However, caster can pull, and caster will generally pull to the side that is least positive. Um, so moving out of screen share here, let's talk about the pros and cons of caster. So we've got caster, positive, and we've got caster, negative. Um, okay, so negative and positive, uh, again, have pros and cons. Again, there are no tire wearing um, component to this. Caster does not affect tire wear, so there is no issue with tire wear. Um, as I mentioned, caster will pull to the side that's most positive. So if I have one side that is negative one caster, again, you won't see negative, but just for the sake of example, and one side that is uh, zero, it's gonna pull to the side that is less positive. So it'll go to the negative number. If I've got positive side on, uh, positive five uh, degrees on one side caster and positive four degrees on one side, 
it's gonna pull to the positive four because it's less positive than the positive five. So just keep that in mind. It does sort of affect where in your, uh, it, it can affect a little bit of uh, your, your uh, not your track width, I'm sorry. Um, it can affect where your tire sits sort of in the wheel well. And so the reason why less positive casts are will give you a pull is because I might have a front and rear tire, something like that. And even if it's affected, I'm gonna draw this excessively so you can see it, but it's usually very minute. If I've got my front right tire that sits like that, my rear is sitting the same as the left, I've got a longer distance from, here's our the wheelbase is the term I was trying to think, sorry, my brain can't think. Um, I've got a longer wheelbase on this side and a shorter wheelbase on this side, which is gonna create this sort of angle, right? Almost like a cup. So if I take a cup and I roll the cup, the cup always rolls to one side because the bottom of the cup is smaller than the top of the cup most of the time. So that's sort of where our pull comes from. Um, I know, again, I don't wanna to get too in depth on stuff, just trying to sort of make things a little bit easier to understand. Positive caster is going to be very, um, directionally, I feel like I'm not spelling that right. It's very possible. But it's very directionally stable. Um, and that's probably not the best way to put it right now. Um, but uh, you can think of a bicycle or a motorcycle, the more rake it has, the more it really wants to go straight. And the easier it is for it to take itself in that same straight direction, letting off the steering. Um, so if you can ride a bicycle without using the handlebars, unfortunately, that's not because you are super talented. Most of the time, that's because of the rake angle or the caster angle of your steering um, in the bicycle or in, in the motorcycle. So it's extremely directionally stable because it's pointing in the direction that it wants to go. So if this is the direction my car is going and my upper ball joints back here and my lower ball joints back there, it knows where it wants to go. It can, sh it, it is already directing itself in the direction it wants to go. When we start to get too positive, excessively positive, we can run into issues where the car doesn't want to corner very well because it wants to keep going straight. This is something that you might run into, especially in a motorcycle, um, not too much with cars because they don't get that excessive. But if you are looking at something like a German car, like a BMW or a Volkswagen or an Audi, these tend to have very positive uh, caster numbers because these vehicles were made to go very high speeds and be directionally stable on something like the Autobahn. So a downfall of positive caster is going to be that we have a rough ride. And the reason for that, again, here's our upper ball joint, our lower ball joint, and we're moving in this direction. When you go over a bump, all of that force is gonna come back into the passenger compartment. And so you're gonna feel everything in the road. Now some of you guys might be like, man, I've driven BMWs and Audis and they're super comfortable. They have millions of dollars in R&D in their uh, development of their suspension systems to maintain high caster numbers, as well as uh, dampen some of that, uh, that, that roughness coming back into the passenger compartment. That's why a lot of these systems usually have a like a multi-link type of design. I know I didn't really talk about multi-link design, but they have multiple links, kind of like control arms and things like that to help sort of stabilize everything. Um, lots of bushings, lots of bushings to help take up a lot of that slack. So that's what positive caster is going to give you. I'll use another color for negative. Negative, um, uh, we'll say it has a soft ride. Again, because if, let's say my ball joint is right here, I can change where all of that uh, input from the road comes back into the 
into the vehicle. The problem is, is uh, it is definitely less stable, at, especially at high speeds. It doesn't really know where it wants to go. And what will happen is negative, it's, again, you're never gonna see negative numbers, but if we're looking at something really, really low or zero caster, this car's gonna wanna wander very easily. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, a couple of things to note with caster. It does not wear tires, as I mentioned, but it does pull. And it does pull more positive. How much of a difference from side to side do you need? You need, over half a degree plus or minus to pull. So if I have two degrees of positive caster on one side and one degree of positive caster on the other side, it is going to pull because that's more than half a degree, right? Right at half a degree, it's usually more like a drift. We start to get into where it's a full degree, you'll get a full fledged pull. Um, and we can start stacking values like with camber and caster. Um, if I've got a pull to the left from camber and I've got a pull to the left from caster, that car is going to pull really hard to the left. Um, I might have a pull to the left from camber or a pull to the right from caster that can cancel each other out as well. So you can get really, we can talk all semester about alignment angles. Um, again, which is why the suspension and steering class is, um, gonna get a lot more in depth in this. So I just wanted to sort of bring that up for caster. Now let's go to our last one, which is going to be one we actually already kind of talked about, which is tow. Here we go. Okay, here's it. Oh, I stole this picture from DSport on Google. Um, hopefully it's on Google. I just Googled caster and it came up. So hopefully DSport, if anybody watches this, please don't be mad at me. Um, you put up a really good picture. <laughs> so neutral or nothing for caster, right? Zero caster meaning the upper mounting point of my strut and my lower ball joint here is going to have no angles, perfectly straight up and down. Negative caster, as I mentioned, you're never going to see. Um, but if you did, it would look something like this. So our suspension is, uh, our upper mounting point is in front of our lower mounting point. For positive caster, our upper mounting point is behind our lower mounting point. And again, this is ideal for directional stability. So um, just keep that in mind. Okay, toe, finally. Toe, and this first bullet point is, is a little bit funky. So let me try to explain here. Toe is going to be the difference in distance between the front and rear, and it says right here, the front wheels. I'm just really referring to a set of wheels. So if we're looking at, um, and in fact, actually, I'm just gonna draw a picture because it'll be a lot easier. Um, I'll, I'll show you what toe actually looks like and how we measure that. But first things first, we've got toe in, where um, the front of our tires are pointed in kind of like pigeon toe, right? If somebody walks pigeon toe, that is toe in. That is also known as positive toe. Um, you're gonna wanna make note of that. Toe out is kind of like, um, like how ducks maybe walk or ballerinas walk with their toes pointed outward. Toe out is gonna be what we consider negative toe. And something I wanna mention here, um, is that a toe is a tire wearing angle. In fact, it is the worst tire wearing angle because it eats up tires faster than camber does. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. It is not an angle that's going to cause a pull. So please keep that in mind. Here's why, even if I've got one tire that's facing in one direction and one that's going straight, you're like, oh, this, this car's gonna pull to the right. When you start to move forward, it actually gets distributed between both sides, and I don't wanna get too into that, but toe technically doesn't really cause pulling. Camber and caster causes pulling. Toe will cause things like wandering back and forth, or it will cause a shimmy in the steering wheel. Um, and I'll explain why here in a moment. So just keep that in mind. Let me go ahead and stop share. We'll go back here. And instead of caster, 
Last thing we will talk about toe. There is one more slide after this. I will talk about it. It has to do with toe. Um, we'll talk about the rest line in a moment here. But toe itself, and as I mentioned, I already talked about it, so I'll, I'll try to be brief here. Um, toe is going to be, we'll say, a positive toe. Uh, let me do it just the way that I've been doing it. Positive toe. is going to look like this. So positive toe is where, um, and, and I want to make this clear here, this is a top view, okay? We're looking at it from the top, like a bird's eye view, right? The front of, um, let me back up here, because I did mention I, I, I wanted to explain that first bullet. I'm going to make a break here, and we're going to use a different color. If these are my two tires, my two, we'll say it's my front wheels, but it could easily uh, be my rear wheels. Make that a little bit further apart here. Toe is going to be the difference in distance from the front of that set of tires to the rear of that set of tires. So if there is no dish, let's just say, just throwing stuff out there, let's say there's 30 inches between, I don't know if you guys can see that, 30 inches between the front of my set of wheels and 30 inches to, in between the, the rear of one set of wheels. There is zero difference, there are the, therefore there would be zero toe, right? What if I had positive toe? Again, we're looking at the top of uh, the vehicle, so this would be the front. If I'm looking at a positive setup, what we're looking at is like a pigeon toe type of setup, and this is very obviously exaggerated. So the diff the distance between the front of the tires and the rear of the tires are going to be a bit smaller up here, further back here. If hopefully that makes sense. So something like this could be, and like I said, you may see it in degrees, you may see it in inches, you may see it in millimeters. Um, this is going to be what we call positive toe. Here's some problems with positive toe. It's going to cause a shimmy. Um, and it is going to wear the, uh, we'll say excess, Where on uh, outside of tires. And there's something um, that I want to mention here. You're going to want to know the term feathered. A feathered edge means that uh, it means that if I run my hand across the edge of a tire, in one direction, it's smooth, kind of like a snake. And then if I run it back in the other direction, it's sharp. Again, kind of like a reptile with scales, smooth in one direction, sharp in the other. That's a feathered edge. And the reason why toe is what gives this sort of characteristic on tire wear is because, if we're, again, if we're looking at the top of my tires and my vehicle is moving this direction, this tire wants to move in this direction. This tire wants to move in this direction, but they're fixed. They're bolted on, so they can't. So they end up getting dragged on the outside edge. And because they're being dragged, it creates a wear in one direction on the outside edge of that tire. And so that, that's why this happens a lot faster uh, than camber tire wear is because not only is it using more of that side of the tire, but it's also dragging it. Um, so toe can cause bad gas mileage, because again, we're dragging um, in either negative or positive. But if we're shimming, the tires want to move inward and they can't. So they're sort of dragging across, creating a shimmy in the steering wheel. Now on the flip side, we can have negative toe where my tires are facing outward. That would be, again, this is the front of the vehicle. Um, so the distance of the front of the tires and wheels in the front is longer than the rear. That is negative. So problem.
problems with this design is it is going to cause a wandering because this tire wants to move in that direction, that tire wants to move in that direction, and so when you're driving, the car wants to go in this direction, that direction, this direction, that direction, and so you don't really get a pull in one side or the other, it sort of just wanders. And the worse this is, the worse your wandering will be, same with the, the shimmy on the other side. Um, and in this one, it's going to be, because it's dragging on the inside edge, we're gonna get, uh, I'm just gonna put inside edge feathering. Um, the feathering tends to happen on front tires, while on the rear tires, even though it may still feel like feathering, it tends to wear in stripes. So if you're sort of standing further back, you can actually see wear stripes in the tires on rear wheels. So it's sort of a funny thing, um, but that is toe. Generally, toe is going to be, uh, uh, it, Generally, toe's gonna, you're gonna want toe close to zero, right? We don't want too much angle negative or positive. But especially when you're working on old cars, especially where we've got parallelogram type suspension, or I'm sorry, steering, where we could end up with looseness. And like I said, well, this is kind of an old car thing um, that I learned at the hot rod shop. But when we're looking at that type of design, it's not bad to get a little bit of outside toe. And I'm not going to get into Ackerman angle. I'm not going to get into toe out on turns um, because I'm going to leave that for a suspension class. I just want to sort of briefly touch this. Um, sometimes you may want to get a little bit of negative toe to load your steering joints um, or else it, they may end up sort of wobbling about and then you'll get wandering from that. So just a little bit of negative toe sometimes is good. It also can help out a little bit with toe out on turns, um, but we won't get into that right now. Again, um, I don't want to get into things like Ackerman Angle. Your book talks about it briefly, um, but we're going to get a lot more into that when we get into a suspension and steering class. So that is toe. Um, we'll go back to our screen share and we'll finish this up here. Okay, so here is a sort of better picture um, that I can draw. So we've got zero toe, both tires are pointing perfectly straight forward with no angle, toe in is our positive, and here is toe out being our negative. This is the last thing I'll talk about here, and this is thrust line angles. So thrust line is going to essentially be kind of like toe of our rear, right? So this one's toe out, this one's toe in, which this can happen all the time. And if this happens on your front wheels, this actually, even if we have excessive thrust line on our rear wheels, we can get that steering wheel off center I was talking about. They didn't really talk about that too much um, in toe. Again, we'll talk about that when we get into alignments um, in the suspension and steering class. So alignment of our rear wheels in relation to the front wheels. If I have a thrust line, you can see here, we'll say maybe it's five degrees to the right. Um, uh, that means I've got toe out on one side and toe in on the other. So the car actually wants to go in that direction. This, instead of calling, ca uh, causing what we could call a pull, it's very similar. Instead, it's a push. And not to be confused with like you get too much push and turn uh, like understeer. Um, I'm talking about meaning the car will actually want to pull in one direction or the other, but it's not actually pulling. It's because the rear wheels are pushing in the opposite direction. So if we're looking at something like this, and I've got a thrust line going in this direction, um, a lot of times, especially in like a toe and go type of scenario, what they'll do is they'll align or a thrust line alignment they'll align the front wheels to the rear wheels. If I have a solid rear axle, I may not have an option because if I have a thrust line that is excessive with the solid rear axle design, I don't have any adjustment at all. If I have independent suspension, I may have adjustment and I may be able to help fix the thrust line so we can have proper alignment in the front as well. If I have to do a thrust line alignment and it ends up something like this picture here, what we'll get is something called dog tracking as well as a steering wheel off center. So before I finish here, I wanna explain what dog tracking is. And I wanna explain the steering wheel off center on the board, as I mentioned earlier. So right off the bat, what 
what we're looking at is the picture that I just sort of showed you guys. So my rear wheels are pointed in one direction, and that means I need to align my front wheels to do the same thing. So if I don't align my front wheels to do the same thing, let's say we do this. I align my front wheels so they're perfect, going straight. And my rear wheels, are actually in a thrust line that wants to do something like that. And I align my fronts, I don't pay attention to my rears. As soon as I take off, the rear of this vehicle wants to go this way, which is gonna cause, let me use another color here, which is gonna cause my front wheels to need to correct in the opposite direction. So the car is gonna naturally want to pull to the left, even though my rear wheels want to go right. I actually have a little wagon at school to show you this, but I don't have here because they won't let me back in the office. So um, this type of thrust line is gonna cause a pull to the left, believe it or not. So what you're gonna do as a driver is you are going to correct that, right? If I correct that with my steering wheel, my steering wheel is no longer, so this would be with my steering wheel straight right? The car's going to want to pull to the left. Well, we don't want that because I need to go straight. So you are going to correct inside the car by turning the steering wheel, right? To correct. Now my car goes straight. Um, and what we're doing is essentially turning our front wheels to match the thrust line of our rear wheels. So the car will go straight. It won't pull, I can let go of the steering wheel, but my steering wheel is not straight. The car's going straight, but the steering wheel is not straight. That's called an SWOC, or steering wheel off center. Now, what if you do a thrust alignment and we align our front wheels to the rear with our steering wheel straight? Well, I might get a straight steering wheel, but the problem is, is all of my wheels are going in this direction. And so we get something called dog tracking. And if you've ever seen a dog run, dogs don't run straight on. They sort of run at this weird angle. And I, I, I don't know why I'm not a vet. Maybe I'll ask somebody who knows more about animals than me. But uh, it almost seems like maybe to make room in between their legs so their legs don't run into each other. Um, they sort of run at this weird funky angle. And I'm pretty sure that's where the term dog tracking came from. If it came from somewhere else, shoot it in the comments so I know. But I'm pretty sure that's where that came from. Um, so if we get a scenario where we have to do a thrust alignment, I've got a solid rear axle, I can't fix that, and I do that to get my steering wheel straight, the car may look like it's going straight, and it is going straight, my steering wheel is straight, but the kind of body doesn't look like it's necessarily going straight. That is not because of a bent frame. A lot of people see that and they're like, oh, that car must have been in an accident. No, that's an alignment issue. And it's called dog tracking. If you're not sure if your car is dog tracking, you can make a little water box at home, outside in the street. Um, for those of you who are not racing people, a water box is uh, like a wet spot in the road where um, they would use to do burnouts and stuff prior to a launch. So just spray some water down on the ground and drive your car through it and look at the tracks coming out. You should only have two tracks because the rears should be aligned with the front. Um, if your car is dog tracking, and it's sort of angled at that weird angle, I'm gonna have four tracks, two for my front and two for my rear that are following. Um, and you can usually see this when you're on the freeway or driving. Um, if I'm behind a vehicle and I can see the left front fender from the back, um, then it's probably dog tracking. So anyways, that is thrust line. Um, that is what dog tracking is. Uh, hopefully this was helpful to you. Again, we are going to be doing a Zoom question and answer session. Um, if you have any questions at all about the homework, about lecture, um, let me know how you guys are doing just to see that you're alive. Uh, like I said, it's not going to necessarily be a lecture, but it's going to be more of a Q&A. So please join in, even if it's just for a few minutes, just so I can see what y'all are doing and see how you guys are reacting to this new sort of lecture thing, because um, some feedback would be helpful. So I hope everybody has a wonderful week. Good luck on the test. Make sure you do your homework before you do the test. Um, Ms. Jasmine's gonna be doing an SI session here. Actually, she probably just got finished with it um, today. And then um, 
no, what day? I don't even know what day it is. No, she'll be doing it on Monday at 4.50 to 5.50, I believe, and then another one uh, right before our Q&A. So it'll be a perfect segue um, from her SI session on Wednesday into the Q&A at six o'clock on Zoom. If you have any questions, again, message me. Um, and have a good one, guys. I will see you later.